the gun, the gun business is very up and down. And I learned this holding Cabela's. It goes through these hot cycles and cold cycles and you know, one minute everybody's running out to buy guns and bullets and the next minute no one freaking cares about buying guns and bullets. Ooh. Ooh, dollar net retention is down to 100%. That's not something a lot of people are going to like to see. People really want to see dollar net retention over 110%. And a lot of people, you know, great numbers if you can go over like 115%. It's actually amazing that, you know, uh, they hardly lost money. They lost $2 million. That, that, that is a level of confidence, I would guess you can say, in regards to RH stock. When, you know, you can only lose $2 million, and I mean everything worked against you. Everything. When? To your end. But this I'm year, saying, year end? Well, I think... Oh, wait, I'm not even ready for the live stream yet, folks, but I got to put this up. Tom Lee, I'll put this up for you guys. Tommy? I'm Rally not even ready yet. Rallied. It's actually there you go. improving liquidity rally. I'm not ready for this. Investors took I'm not here right now. Out of stocks this year. So you are, you're a believer in the broadening of the move and you think it carries beyond the calendar turn. Yeah, because now as we get into next year, uh, we'll have an FOMC decision, but I think it's going to show the Fed is no longer fighting an inflation war, but really shifting towards managing the business cycle. Huge change. Um, I think interest rates could make a huge move lower. Mark Newton, our technician, thinks it could be three, three and a half percent, three point two, and that would take mortgage rates down to five or under five percent. We know that would help the economy, and I think there's a lot of pent up demand for capex. So I, I, I'd say that stocks could do very well next year. Well, you must if you think we're going to get to your target for 2024. S and P is 5,200. Yes. What gets us there? Uh, well, it's earnings recovery, so we think earnings hit 265 by 2025. That's two years of like 9% growth. And you put a 20 PE, a 20 PE has happened 50% of the time when the 10 years between 4 and 5%. So it's the most common PE to apply, and that would be 5200. But I think that's conservative because 265 is 5% of it's coming from cash, right? So there's like 3% organic growth. I mean, cash earnings is 5% of growth right now per year. I hear bears say earnings aren't going to be as good because inflation is not going to be as good for earnings. And that's going to be a negative. And that's why the market's overvalued. And people like you at 260 $260 are just way too optimistic on where earnings are going to be. Uh, well, I think people should study the PPI. Uh, like four or five sectors are correlated to PPI, like materials, energy. Meaning is inflation falls, they, they make less money, but tech and industrials have almost no correlation to inflation. And then financials are positively correlated. So I think you have more groups that could actually have better earnings power into next year. And especially if caution comes off companies, you know, CapEx, there's a lot of pent up demand in CapEx. Five out of 10 groups actually sort of cut CapEx as a percentage of revenues last year. So you have a CapEx opportunity, you have a home recovery opportunity, and you have interest rates falling. It's it's hard to say stock should fall next year. So the market thinks the Fed's going to cut first in March, three meetings from now. Is that what you think? Uh, I mean, to me, that intuitively seems aggressive. But what's going to matter more is what the bond market starts to price. And I think the two the two year is telling us the Fed does have to cut meaningfully next year because if they don't cut and inflation weakens, the level of real Fed funds is associated with a hard landing. Like the Fed, if they're trying to manage the business cycle, would be cutting rates. Yeah, but you think it could be a little aggressive in, in terms of March. Do you do you need the Fed to be somewhat aggressive in cutting to get to your 5,200? Uh, we just need the market to get comfortable with two things, that the curve can stay inverted, meaning the tenure could actually go to 2.5 and the Fed's still at four. And the second is that stocks and bonds don't have to be positively correlated. So yields could go up and stocks could rise. So I, I think that there's some protection or buffer against if the Fed doesn't cut rates. How much do you need uh, cash to come in from money markets that's been sitting in safety and now it goes towards risk assets because rates have come down and you get better yield out of the equity market? Yeah, I mean, Scott, I, this year if someone bought FANG, they'd be up you know, 85%. That's 15 years of money market cash. If they buy small caps next year and small caps are at 50, that's 10 years. So I do think the $240 billion that left is coming back in. But hedge funds also have very light positioning in equities. I mean, I don't know if you saw that there's almost a 
five-year low in hedge fund positioning and financials. And financials really should be where things turn next year. You think financials are going to be one of the leaderships? What about small caps? Because that's where a lot of the conversation has been of yeah. like this awakening that the Russell has had. Yes. Um, there's still a lot of non-believers. Yes. Uh, I think there's the callus in place. We've had 12 years of underperformance. The price to book of small caps to the large caps is exactly where it was in 99, which was the start of a 12-year bull run. Uh, banks are a huge weight in small caps. We know falling rates helps asset quality, so regional banks should rally. That should pull up small caps. It's clearly under-owned, and they benefit from inflows. And then, of course, I think large cap banks are really good plays on a capex cycle. So to me, it's easy to see that 20 30% kind of moves in those groups. I mean, small caps may be 50 Whereas it's harder to say FANG can do 50 next year. The other big call that you're making today, despite revealing your target at 5,200, is suggesting that mega caps, tech, not going to lead next that, year. That's right. I Why? Think, uh, it's that I think the earnings growth they produce doesn't look as special if the PMIs are turning up. If the ISM turns up, S&P earnings are going to grow you know, 15 20%. And then on terms of multiple expansion, I think it's, people are going to be more willing to fade a FANG multiple expansion, whereas they'll buy a financials multiple expansion. So I want to be clear. Um, so you think there's going to be a rotation out of mega cap into some of these quote unquote unloved areas? Yes. I mean, I'm, I'm you know, FANG is still a number three pick, which means we, it outperforms. But if someone's saying, where will they get the best risk reward, I think it's clearly financials or industrials. When you, when you say that FANG still outperforms, the, the word you use, put some context to that. What does that mean? Well, let's say s and is up 12 to 15 next year. FANG will be maybe a little bit better, whereas financials probably can be up 30 and industrials can be up 25 and small caps can be up 50. So we're going to really have that significant of a, a mean reversion trade so to speak. Yeah, I think it's consistent. If you look at like the history of a stock like Amazon, they have great, you know, a step up year and then they consolidate. Wow. Let's expand the conversation. Bring in CNBC contributor Joe Terranova of Virtus and Ayako Yoshioka of Wealth Enhancement Group. It's great to have everybody with us. Aya, I, I go to you first. Um, does Tom Lee make a lot of sense or not? Hi. Uh, yes, absolutely. You know, 2023 has really been defined by a very narrow market. And so it makes a lot of sense that going into 2024, uh, that we would see a broadening out of the market, in, especially if the economic data comes in, um, you know, relatively benign, you know, neither too hot or new cold, too cold. So you do think we're going to have a broadening? Do you agree with Tom that, that we're going to have these lagging sectors are going to be the leaders, that tech can still do well, it just doesn't have to carry all of the weight like it did this year? A absolutely. I mean, I, I think if the economy continues to stay relatively strong, I mean, some of the, you know, uh, names in the lower half of the S&P 500 um, have a lot of room to, you know, have the multiple expansion as well as perhaps some upside surprises to their earnings growth as people start to anticipate a recovery from the slowdown uh, in 2025. Joe, is, is Tom too optimistic or not? Well, first of all, Tom's been incredibly accurate so far in 2023, so congratulations for that. Uh, I run an equally weighted strategy, so I'm excited to hear your comments for 2024 because that obviously means the strategy is going to be favored. But there's three points I think we need to hit on. First of all, when you look at the market right now and you talk to advisors who have clients sitting in cash, the first thing that they will tell you is they expect the economy to slow. And the cash that Scott cites going into risk assets, those risk assets are in equities. They want to put those assets into credit because they believe they're also going to get price appreciation. How would you respond to that? Uh, you know, I'm a fan of bonds. You know, high yield returns 80% of stocks with less volatility. Um, but we know that if bonds rally next year, that actually has an expansionary effect on PE. So to the extent people decide to allocate to bonds and, and spreads have a huge rally, it actually means there's upside to the S&P just because the multiple now has more room to expand. So Joe, what, what so Tom says 20 times mm -hmm. earnings make sense. Um, earnings at, at 260 mm -hmm. makes sense. 
Is that too aggressive or not? He's too aggressive with financials. I'm worried about financials. Let me explain why. What about the overall? Well, give me the give me the view. He says 5,200 on the S and P. Follow me. Stay with me. No, I'm, I'm staying with you, Scott. You know me a long time. I don't do S and P price targets. I do the environment. I'm not. I've never sat here and said okay. We're going to 5,200. Okay. Uh, all right. Let the me, environment let, is let, a let me rephrase it. One let me rephrase it invest. into a way that we can agree to have a conversation about this. Is is. Is the environment going to be optimistic enough Absolutely. that the S&P can get to 5,200? I don't know the answer to that. I don't think anyone knows the answer to that. I'm sorry, Tom. I don't think anyone can knows Can we have double-digit returns next year? Yes, absolutely, you can. Okay. Aya, what about you? What do you think? I think we could have double-digit returns, too. But I think the setup is very different going into 2024 than what we had in 2022. You know, we had a lot of upside surprises this year in 2023. Um, and I think we could have some jolts uh, depending upon how the data really pans out um, and how earnings really pan out in 2024. Well, I mean, for earnings to get to, to $260, things have to go really right, don't they? I mean, how perfect, I, I hate to use that word, but in some sense, Things need to be perfect, that inflation needs to come down to target. The Fed definitively needs to be done, if not cutting. The business cycle needs to keep humming. The labor market needs to remain robust so that consumers don't stop spending. Can all of those things mesh and, and make this a perfect, in quotes, scenario? I mean, uh, never say never, uh, but at the same time, it does uh, create difficulties for you know 2024. I, I think you're going to get bouts of it, and it's not going to be a straight path to those potential double-digit returns in 2024. I think the first half could be a little bit more murky as everybody anticipates these rate cuts, and if we don't get them, um, and, and the economic data it really does slow, um, and perhaps more so than everybody anticipates, then that bad news can really create some havoc in markets. Tom, how, how would you assess how I've described what needs to happen for you to be right? Am, am I overstating it? Do uh, things, or, or do things really need to be perfect for well, you to get to 5,200? I mean, here's some simple math to think about. Earnings this year, 225. So we say two years, 265, so $40. You know, 15 is going to come from just interest on the cash. So it's, you know, 25 from organic growth, which is 10% over two years. It's basically GDP of 5% real. Uh, I think that's pretty doable. So unless we have a recession, 265 is actually a low number. It could be 275, 280. Wow. For 2025. In earnings. In earnings. Because remember, buybacks is another five. I mean, just buybacks in cash is 10% a 275, year. 275, 280 will make you like in... I mean, you're so high up, I, we can barely see you. We need a telescope to see your number on on earnings relative to where everybody else on the street is. I haven't heard anybody suggest, gosh, yeah. you could get high as 280. I mean, just keep in mind, this year, healthcare earnings are down 20%. They won't be down 20% for two more years. And basic materials and energy are down like 40, and staples are down. So we could, as those turn, those contribute to S&P earnings meaningfully, especially energy, right? Energy was such a huge swing factor. It's been absent for this year. Why is it going to be better next year? Well, if, if let's say the price stabilizes, so you just look off the curve, they won't be dragging earnings. You'll actually have a positive contribution because they're not declining. So it's, it's not hard to get to 265, actually sounds strange, but that's two years from now. All right. Aya, um, financials, energy, do you like either in 2024? We, we like energy. I, I think the setup for energy still remains very favorable. You know, valuations still aren't at, you know, extremes. I think, you know, you've had some big announcements, uh, you know, in the industry that are consolidating. Um, and, you know, you, you have earnings growth. And if the economy really doesn't slow that much, um, if we get that mild recession or the, you know, soft landing scenario, energy should continue to do well as we go into 2025 and, and, and beyond. Joe, you wanted to take on Tom about his financials call. Why? Financials and energy. First of all, with energy, what if the price doesn't go lower? It keeps 
right. right? If what if the price doesn't go higher, the price goes lower, you get a massive liquidation. Everyone is overweight energy, Tom. You know that. In addition, on financials, where's the where's the earnings growth come from? Because if you think about it, you lose the effective interest income. Interest income was up 22% in 2022, is up 18% in 23. It's actually going to decline next year. JP Morgan and Citi told us yesterday at the Goldman Sachs conference that trading revenues down. You've got all CEOs complaining about regulation in Basel III. What, what does that leave you with? Deal making? Yeah, well, a couple things. One, uh, what you've described is why no one owns financials, right? Because that's why hedge funds have the lowest long positions in five years. Uh, second, as George Boyd, head of Kidder Research, famously says, it takes a whole lot of E to offset PE. The financials trade next year is about price to book or price to earnings, which means it doesn't mean it doesn't matter what earnings do next year. It's how earnings power is transforming. And look, if we have lower interest rates, we know that this saves commercial real estate. It revives housing. I don't think any investor says, oh, well, your Q2 numbers aren't going to be great. They're going to say this is a switch in how we look at earnings power for the next couple of years. So I think financials have huge multiple expansion potential. And then trading, as you know, trading is spontaneous. It, it's weak this quarter. It could be huge next year. I mean, $240 billion taken out, gross exposure is low. I'm not surprised there hasn't been much trading. It's going to pick up a lot next year. But in that scenario, you have to have a soft landing the way you're describing it. I, I hope we don't have a landing. Yes. Well, I don't think Tom is like <laughs> suggesting anything other than that, and if not, no landing, right? I mean, you're, if, if you think we can 270, 280 on earnings, well, we can't even come close to a soft landing. That well, better be a no landing, no late cycle, reacceleration of the economy for all the factors that you suggested. Yes, yeah, Scott. And one thing I think people have lost perspective on is when the Fed went on their tightening campaign and brought rates in the U.S. above any other developed world, we already had a hard landing in Europe and China. So the U.S. True. avoided a hard landing because what broke was outside the U.S. If you think those economies worsen next year, then we're in trouble. But if they're turning around and the DAX is telling you things are turning around in Europe, you don't need a landing in, a, in the U.S. because we had a, a landing elsewhere. Also I, true. I give you the last word. No, I, I think uh, you know Tom always makes some great points about uh, you know the market outlook and betting against Tom uh, has not been favorable, I think, to many investors. So I would go and listen to what Tom has to say. All right, Daya, thank you, Tom. Of course, thank you as well, Joe. We'll see you in the market zone because we have a little broad time to talk about. Look at the move in AMD today, 10%. Wow. What a delayed reaction, huh? Like, what happened all of a sudden? Because AMD showed off all their stuff yesterday. Lucy, Lisa Sue was doing a million interviews yesterday. And then all of a sudden today, AMD pops 10%? Like, what? Was there some sort of new big information leak today or came out? See, the problem is, uh, earnings season, man. By this time of earnings season, which we're pretty much about at the end now, but, like, it just wears me down, man, because it's like, <clears throat> I mean, the amount of <clears throat> times I'll, you know, stay up till 2, 3 in the morning, listen to conference calls, looking at these earnings and crap, like, earnings season is wearing. And by the time I get to the end of earnings season, I'm just, like, so done. So, like, worn down. And then I get my energy back until the next earnings season starts. So this week pretty much wraps up earnings season. Today's really the last big interesting day of earnings. And then after that, it is going to be um, nothing until, as far as earnings go, nothing until... Probably like late January. Late January will start heating up again as far as earnings go. So here's what we have after the bell. Uh, we have Broadcom. We have Lululemon, DocuSign. Smartsheet, I don't know anything about them. I don't know if they're like a wannabe DocuSign or what. RH is the one I care about the most. Veal Re Resorts is also reporting after the bell. Smith & Wesson could be interesting. What? I haven't kept track of Smith & Wesson stock in so freaking long i used to keep track of it back in the day when i owned cabela stock but um yes yeah, cyber truck cyber truck certainly not a beautiful vehicle but certainly a sick vehicle right like you see that and it's just like that's insane that's freaking insane like 
I would love to get a black one, you know, either a gloss black or a matte black or something like that. I definitely wouldn't describe the Cybertruck as beautiful, but I would describe it as just sick. Alfa Romeo, you know, it's an Italian brand, and those Italians, man, Italians got good taste in beauty. I would say that. Italians got very good taste in beauty. Um, so, oh yeah, Smith & Wesson, that's what I want to look at. I haven't kept track of Smith & Wesson's talk in so freaking long. Mm, had a pretty good year. 28% in the past five years. Dang, nothing in the past, well, I don't say nothing in the past 10 years, but 45%, that's it? Gun and ammo stocks down as Supreme Court hears Second Amendment case. Smith & Wesson, uh, Sturm Ruger are down slightly on Tuesday, blah, blah, blah. This is back from November, by the way. The issue is whether individuals with domestic violence orders can be restricted from purchasing firearms. Wow, that's interesting. Several of the high court's conservative justices appear to agree that restrictions should be upheld. Interesting. I'm not, I mean, the thing with something like that, okay, so let's say if you have been, uh, you know, convicted of, of domestic violence, like how many of those people are going to buy you know, a legal gun. That's also my question, like a brand new one or something like that. I, I don't know. Uh, I'm guessing it's a relatively small percentage, but let's see what's going on here. Dang, man. Jeez, our revenue dropped off a freaking cliff. Holy smokes. They did over a billion dollars of revenue in, well, their, their fiscal year ends at a weird time, April 2021. So let's call it April 2020 through April 2021. Company did over a billion dollars in revenue versus last year they did, did less than $500 million. So their revenue dropped over 50% in a two-year stack. That's wild. Gross profit went from 459 dollars down to 168. What's crazy is our gross profit in that April 2021 year ending is basically the same as their current revenues for last year. Jeez. Operating income dropped all the way down to $56 million from over $300 million. The gun, the gun business is very up and down. And I learned this holding Cabela's. It goes through these hot cycles and cold cycles and you know, one minute everybody's running out to buy guns and bullets, and the next minute no one freaking cares about buying guns and bullets. And um, this is something I experienced with Cabela stock. I mean, you know, Cabela stock was a tremendous stock for me. It went on a massive run. And, uh, you know, there was a huge gun boom, and this was when Obama got elected for the second time. And uh, essentially, like, everybody was thought Obama was going to take the guns away. And I think this was around, like, Sandy Hook time and things like that. And so... Like, everybody literally went out and bought guns. Like, I remember going to the gun section at Cabela's. And if you've ever been to big Cabela's, the gun section's massive there, right? And it was like being in a club. Like, it was like no bullets on the shelves because everybody was just buying them out. They thought Obama was going to take all the guns. And so everybody was out there just spending ridiculous sums of money. And all the gun manufacturers uh, benefited huge. And all the, the stores that sold guns and bullets like like Cabela's benefited massively, right? Uh, then we kind of had the come down of that eventually over time, right? And so you look in like here, and the problem is here, right? Who's in office? Who's the president of the United States during these years? You know, 2018, this was, you know, April 2017 to 2018, 2018 to 2019, 2020. Who, who's president during that time? Trump. No one, would, at least from my heard, no one was scared Trump was going to take the guns. And so there was not nearly as much incentive for people to go out and buy guns and bullets, right? Then we had Rona. Rona, obviously all the stimulus money pumped out there and everything went up as far as sales went pretty much during that little period of time. But on top of that, you had a lot of people fearful of like um, all types of stuff. Like people were talking about like it was going to be anarchy and, you know... Like, it was like the end of the world, you know, like people were really convinced of that in 2020, right? And so when people get very fearful and scared, 
they go out and run and buy guns and bullets. <laughs> and so Smith & Wesson's business took off like a rocket ship, right? Then you had the come down of that and look what it did to the sales numbers. Like, and so that's a gun and bullet business, man. It's a, it's a business, but it's an up and down business. That's for dang sure. Consumers, two thirds of the economy. DocuSign's okay. spiking up. Uh, gentlemen, stay with us because we're starting to get our earnings. The first ones are out. Lululemon, uh, I'm going to go. run through those numbers here. Not immediately clear that adjusted EPS result is comparable with street consensus, so I'll just give that number first. Adjusted EPS of $2.53 per share. Looks like revenues beating here, $2.2 billion versus street estimates of $2.19 billion. Q4 revenue guidance, though, looks a tad light. We're seeing 3.14 to 3.17 billion dollars in revenue for the fourth quarter versus uh, consensus of consensus estimates of 3.18 billion dollars. Initiating one billion dollar hmm. buyback here. A couple other stats for Lululemon that really matter. Total comparable sales increased 13 percent. Comparable impressive. store sales up nine percent. Direct to consumer net revenue up 18 percent. And here's another one that matters with retailers uh, in general. Gross margin increased 110 basis points to 57 percent as well. Nonetheless, uh, with that light Q4 revenue guidance and a stock that was up something like 40 percent going into this print, you're seeing shares down about 7 percent right now. Sounds, Morgan, like they're determined to hold their pricing levels, not give that up in order to boost revenue. They don't want to do discounting into this holiday season. It, it seems like that. And you do have this commentary from CEO Calvin McDonald as well in the release where he says, uh, as we enter the holiday season, we are pleased with our early performance and are well positioned to deliver for our guests in the fourth quarter. But we'll have to see what additional insights and color we get from the call. And of course, we will be joined. Main issue. Kelsey to break down these results and just. Main issue with Lulu is the valuation. Main and maintain that revenue. Not really Dr. sales, it's the valuation. Are out. Pippa Stevens has hey, Pippa. Hey, John, that stock jumping 9% here after the company beat top and bottom line <laughs> estimates for <laughs> the third quarter. DocuSign earned 79 cents Lulu. per share on an adjusted basis. That was wow. 16 cents ahead of estimates. Whoa. Revenue coming in at 700 million, also ahead of the expected nice. 690 million. The company also giving optimistic Q4 revenue guidance, saying they expect the range to be 696 to 700 million, while analysts we're looking for 694 million. The CEO also said that they're making progress on moving beyond e-signature and into intelligent agreement management. Once again, that stock up 9%. Morgan. Wow. All right, that's Lulu. Lulu, Lulu, Lulu. Now let's go ahead. Let's knock out RH next. RH, RH. RHIR. R H. Oh, Broadcom is slightly light. Fifty billion. Street was Ooh, looking for around fifty-two miss. billion for that full year revenue number, and then increasing that quarterly dividend. They say here this uh, common stock dividend going up by fourteen percent to five dollars and twenty-five cents. Stock down more than three percent here after hours. John, back to you. All right, that's going to be an important call to get color. Yeah, and by the way, make sure everybody that's on here right now, make sure you stay for the R H call. I don't care if you care anything about the furniture business and RH's business model, but trust me, stay for the call. It's always entertaining. It's always insightful. You'll learn a lot about business on the RH call. There's a reason it's my favorite conference call to listen to. You're going to learn a lot about the economy and what the wealthy are thinking right now. Trust me, there's a reason why. I listen to the RH call usually two to three times every earnings season. And uh, I don't even have any money to invest in the stock right now. Which shows how much those are those conference calls matter to me. Might have hoped, but certainly uh, not not all ah. that much. Uh, we would have think. In fact, I think we think the Fed thinks that they're done. There ugly, is a risk ugly. That they may need to do uh, more. Uh, but importantly, Morgan and John, the Fed has indicated, and we think that Chair Powell will re repeat this on next Wednesday. Um, is they can start to think about cutting rates even before inflation gets to two if they're convinced that the progress uh, is real. The board has appointed Anthony Maloney to serve as interim CEO. This, of course, comes amid pressure from Elliott Management, which has amassed about a $2 billion stake That's in the company. Right there. Now, sign, earlier today, sign. Elliott did send a letter saying that based on the feedback they've received since announcing their campaign, uh, they good, say that... Uh, this is DocuSign. Customer base, 1.47 million. 
uh, obviously massive TAM out there. $692 million in billings. The numbers are pretty impressive out of um, DocuSign. They've really improved a lot. I mean, a lot, a lot um, with their with their financials, right? I mean, we know we're moving into an age where everything's digitally signed and digital contracts and all these sorts of things, right? And so that benefits them more than anybody. They have a few competitors, HelloSign, which is owned by Dropbox and a few other companies, but... You know, obviously DocuSign's the big dog in the space. And so the e-signing of everything definitely bodes well for them. And then, like I said, their their income statement was pretty good. You know, B, B plus. They've improved a lot. They've improved a lot. Their GNA is a little out of control, in my opinion. You know, that was up, what, almost 30% year over year? Uh or 20%, 20 in the 20 to 30 range. So that's just was a little little high for me in regards to DocuSign. Obviously, they got, I mean, a lot of customers. A lot of customers, a lot of big brand names. Ooh. Ooh, dollar net retention is down to 100%. That's not something a lot of people are going to like to see. People really want to see dollar net retention over 110 percent and a lot of people you know great numbers if you can go over like 115 percent so that metric probably scares some people i'll be honest with you guys there okay because i mean now they're down to 100 percent. now you're talking about could you go down to 90 something percent and you know you for this type of business model you just can't really go under 100 percent. it's going to be seen as an extremely bad thing for the business model so they're at a pretty precarious situation right now, DocuSign is. Wow. You know, this stock has just been obliterated. I mean, look at this. It was 279 bucks back in 2021. Back in 2020, it was 200 plus dollars a share. 47 here today. Um, so, yeah, it's a little bit of a mixed bag with, you know, where... It's a little bit of a mixed bag because I really like what I see in terms of that income statement. But in terms of, you know, some of these other financial metrics, it's not very good. Hello, and welcome to the Q3 2023 RH Q&A conference call. All lines have been placed on mute to prevent any background noise. After the speaker's remarks, there will be a question and answer session. And moved our business 15 to 20 points. It just would have permanently created a different model. And so, um, you know, look, some people are promoting and cutting ad costs. Some people are doing a lot of different things and hoping they have a massively different model. I, I you know, there might be people that come out of this thing with a, with a slightly better model. Uh, maybe there's some things they learned. Maybe they don't have to spend as much in ad costs, maybe this or that. So, um, but it's, it's not really people that we compete with that I, you know, that I'm too concerned with. I'm more focused on, you know, what we are doing and what our big strategies are, and uh, you know, getting a, a really a good feel for it. So, um, yeah, I mean, obviously, very different than England. Yeah, and uh, um, so we wish everyone a, a wonderful and happy holiday, and uh, and you know, wish for. You know, peace in the Middle East, and uh, you know, and hopefully this world becomes a a more peaceful place very soon. So, happy holidays, everyone! You know, it was a fine conference call there. Um, you know, given the the market they have right now, uh, it's just the balance. I mean, excuse me, the income statement's a mess, as to be expected right now. Right, revenues down over a hundred million dollars year over year. Cost of goods sold up to fifty four percent versus fifty one percent. Gross profits down to 45% from 48%. Selling general administrative, 38% versus 28%. I mean, it's just everything's bad, right? Um, with that being said, even with such a disastrous, I mean, complete disastrous everything right now uh, for RH's income statement, it's actually amazing that, you know, uh, they hardly lost money. They lost $2 million dollars. That, that, that is a level of confidence, I guess you can say, in regards to RH stock. 
when you know you can only lose ten, two million, and I mean everything worked against you, everything. Um, let's be very clear: the luxury housing market does get no worse than the the cycle we're in right now, right? Even in a in a, a worse economy, but low interest rates, like even that would be better because right now there's a stalemate. And for our age business model, they need people moving because a lot of people don't consider going out there and spending money on furniture until they go buy a new property, a new house. And it's just, we got a very much a stalemate in the luxury home. I mean, the housing market in general, but especially the luxury end, um, the, the properties just aren't moving. And so that, that really just kills our age business right now. So the fact that this is about the worst case scenario for an ARH, like they, they, they would probably take a regular recession where rates are dropping over what's going on right now in the housing market. And the fact that they only lost 2 million, like that's eh, actually, I would say it's a uh, rather impressive uh, for their business model overall. And considering they opened, let's see, RH England would have been fully open during this quarter, which is a huge cost. I can guarantee that for the business as well. They don't, they don't rip out the numbers here, but I guarantee that's a big, probably on the sg and line there, um, cost of business. So overall, um, we'll see. Okay. Appreciate y'all joining me as always. Thanks so much, folks. Much love and uh, have a great one. And yeah, no live streams until Monday. See you back Monday. Other than that, got a main channel video I got to start prepping now. So peace, guys. Hope you enjoyed that conference call and uh, have a great one.